Like a lot of films that I really hold dear, once I've seen them, I, I almost forget sometimes the first instance of seeing them because when a film is as brilliant as this one, or I don't know, there's a number of other films I could have picked, Carrie would have been a good one as well, you sort of feel like they've always been with you. There's this kind of sense that there can't have been a time before you saw Me Being Tom or before you saw Carrie because it feels like they're part of your brain. Uh, another one which I saw here for the first time, so I went to Oxford and that was where my love of films really awakened and, and transformed into something that might you know, actually be a viable career rather than a hobby, um, it was Apocalypse Now, which I saw here. I think, this, I think this has been renovated, I was trying to work it out, but I was here sort of 2001 to 2004 and this is the space where I saw um, so many brilliant films on rep that, that I wouldn't have been able to see growing up in Bournemouth where there's a sort of there's an Odeon with three screens, and when I was growing up, it was showing you know, the Matrix sequels and, and Bond films. And not that there's anything wrong with that at all, but it wasn't showing you any of the other stuff that was out there. And it was slightly before the internet came along and made everything available. So my cinematic adolescence was quite geared to what was in the multiplex at the time. And you know, coming to Oxford and going to events like this one as a student was it, it's really, really informed the uh, way that I've since broken out and you know, produced documentaries and become a critic and work for film for. It's a contemporary of Psycho, but it upset people far more than Psycho, even though Psycho is, you see the knife, you see the blood. I think Peeping Tom is because Mark's so sympathetic. You can see exactly why he is the way that he is, and you can feel sorry for him, even though he's doing these dreadful things, whereas a psycho is a bit more of a kind of a comedy monster once, once you know, we experience the reveal. I mean, that's my theory anyway. I think both of those films are films that you can read in lots of different ways. I mean, it can't be overstated how badly this film went down when it was released. They had a big premiere for it, and there's a, a wonderful picture of, of Carl Burnham, the star, and the writer, who was actually also a cryptologist, fascinating man, who sort of worked at Bletchley Park and was instrumental in stopping the Nazis. So, I mean, do look him up. And then Michael Powell, and they're all standing there at the premiere in there. They've got their glad rags on, they're ready for a nice night out, and they're, they're smiling. And it's like Somebody says this in a blog somewhere, it's like looking at photographs of the people boarding the Titanic happy for the last time on camera before the ship went down because the premiere played to absolute silence. The VIPs, you know, they stood outside waiting to be congratulated afterwards and everyone just filed past them. Every, you know, A-list star, every uh, politician or whoever who had been invited to see the premiere of Michael Powell, who is a big deal in British film at this time. I mean, I'm trying to think, um, imagine if Ken Loach or Mike Lee or something made like a torture porn film and invited the Queen to the premiere and then she walked past him without saying anything at the end. That was the kind of atmosphere. Um, so really, really shocking. And I think that part of the reason for that, as you say, was it's such a British film. The British film industry at that time, it's, you know, it's the Ealing films and we're heading into sort of the carry-on period the Doctor. It's quite kind of cute and cosy and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's really brilliant stuff in the Ealing films, in Ealing comedies. And, but there is something shocking about seeing the locations that you're used to seeing, maybe, you know, Alec Guinness doing a comedy caper. Seeing those same locations in London, those Soho locations employed in the service of something that's so demonstrably kind of sleazy. And I mean, I wouldn't like, defend the film morally. I think it's kind of gross, but that's the attraction of it, if that makes sense. Like you can feel yourself wanting to see these terrible events unfold. At the time, film critics essentially, they had more power. You know, if yeah. you were the film critic on the Evening Standard, you might be one of 12 reviews of the film, whereas now you're one of like 100, 200. Uh, you can always find somebody championing a film. You can yeah. always find somebody denigrating it. I mean, if they're denigrating a Marvel or a DC film on Buffy Tomatoes, you could also find that critic then being denigrated in the comments. So there's just a multiplicity of opinions. And whether or not that's a good thing for the film industry uh, is totally up for debate. I mean, it obviously it democratizes it, uh, so it's a good thing on that level. On another level, it can make it harder to find sort of opinions from people with a broad range of film watching experience. 
that's not necessarily a good thing. I'd sometimes rather read something by someone really sharp who hasn't seen too many films and is coming to something really fresh than I would from someone who's reviewed 15 films a week for the last 60 years. And then there are other films where I want the considered opinion. I mean, I suppose that a more rounded answer is that a variety of opinions is a good thing. Mm -hmm. and I do think it's really interesting. I don't know now whether you would have that same kind of sense of critics getting it so wrong that mm -hmm. feels like it's what happened with Peeping Tom because there would be other people out there to whose tastes that film catered if it was something with as much merit as Peeping Tom, you know, it might get rejected by the broadsheets but the blogging community would pick up on it. So I think I think that diversity of opinion means that you're probably not going to get that black and white scenario that you have with Peeping Tom to the same extent. Since becoming a producer as well, yeah. I find it harder to write about things that I've hated because I can completely picture yeah, yeah. on a very human level what it's like to sort of read that yeah, that plan from someone who thinks that you should never have been born, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah. I try to write thing, only things that I would be, if not happy, at least be able to say to somebody's face which is not true of my early writing when I started out when I was 21. You just don't feel like you're writing to a real person when you write a film review, so you're just sort of getting in as many kind of vicious gags as you can for the ones that you didn't like. And yeah, um, I, that's got softer in, in my old age. It's about trying to only write things that you would, you can, you can definitely justify, you can back it up, you would say, yeah, I stand by this opinion. Um, and maybe it's not something you would say to someone if you bumped into them at a party, but it'd be something you'd be happy to stand up in court and, and read out, you know. Uh, and then, yeah, you just have to try and think about the fact that, A, it's a human being on the other end, and in terms of doing service to criticism and not sort of writing a rave for everything just because everything was made by somebody human, um, you have to think about the audience, you have to think about people are paying their hard-earned money to see this film, and it kind of annoys me as well when critics seem to forget that and go, oh yeah, it's sort of all right, um, yeah, yeah, it's, go and see it, go and see it. It's like, yeah, but that's people's money, and you know it's not very good. I think it's to do with the sympathy that we have for the killer, and it's not, it's not like he's presented as a sympathetic character, but, you know, an, an innocent, then later we find out he's a killer. He's presented as a killer from frame one, and yet he's also presented in a very human way. You can see him struggling with his impulses. You can see that he kind of like does and doesn't want to do this. Um, he's, I don't know if morally complex is the right word, but he's also, it's, it's in the casting, you know, he's like this, ha he's this quite handsome guy um, with those big, beautiful eyes. He's not the sort of 1960s cinema's idea of a maniac, you know, a, a killer in cinema at that time is much more likely to be Vincent Christ, Christ hanging out in a mad castle somewhere, you know, chaining virgins to the wall and cackling. Uh, he's, he's way more real than that. But like I say, I think you can write kind of whatever you want now in film criticism because there are so many critiques and so many outlets and so many opinions. It's quite hard to come up with a line that's really going to annoy people um, or really sort of be challenged on mass other than in that area of um, social justice, I guess. I mean, Camilla Long annoyed a lot of people uh, recently with her critique of Ken Loach's I, Daniel Blake. Um, I can't remember what, the, it was, yeah, it was loads, a loathsome piece, but I think that's the sort of area you have to be writing in now to kind of really anger people. Just having a different opinion from other people about a film isn't really enough.